How's it going guys? So I'm sure the first thing on some of your minds is why exactly am I making this? Or you're some lost soul who has somehow got led into this desolate corner of YouTube that my channel currently resides in. Whatever the case, the reason I'm making a video like this is I have been working a lot on my next installment in my JRPGs Told Long series. And I've kind of hit the like, halfway point as it were? I've made enough of them now that I have a sort of general idea of how long it's gonna take me to finish them, and I kind of realized that I was probably still about a month away from actually finishing the damn thing. But on the other end of it, it has been over a month since I last uploaded a video as well. So I figured I should probably try and upload something so that my channel isn't just radio silence for two months straight and I lose what microscopic speck of recognition I managed to worm out of the YouTube algorithm. But that comes with a problem, because if I start taking time to edit one of my usual videos, then that's going to set back the release of my next hold long by a fair amount, because all of my time will be going into editing a different video. So I needed a video that I could make relatively quickly without interrupting my usual work. And after a fair amount of thought, I decided to settle on something like a podcast. I mean, something where I just kind of talk for a while, and that way I don't really have to worry about gathering clips or images and stuff like I normally do, nor do I really have to seriously script it or anything, which saves me a whole lot of time. So, uh, if you watch my channel just for my summaries of games, then you should just consider this an update, and you can be on your way right here. I'll be finished my next video probably in January sometime, later rather than sooner, but I'm working on it. Until then, uh, have a happy holidays, I guess. It is that time of year, isn't it? Uh, anyways, let's just move on to the main point of this video. I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about, and I realized that despite talking at length about the Persona series, I've never really given my opinion on how I feel about each game. I mean, obviously I've hinted at it and given my opinions on certain aspects of each game, but I've never really done a sort of broad overview of how I feel about each entry in the series. So, uh, why not do that right now, I thought. It's a simple topic that I'm sure some people are interested in, maybe? I don't know, give it a try. Um, yeah, so the best way I felt to do that was to go through each game as I came across them and talk about, about what I was going through when I came across each game and how the series has managed to become one of my favorites. So, it all began back in 2008, I think? Uh, I can't remember exactly when it was, but I remember vividly visiting my local game store with one goal in mind. To find a game I could just lose myself in. A game I could spend hours upon hours playing with no ending in sight. I'm pretty sure I had just finished a game that played a similar role in my life, though I can't really remember what it was. Like, Dot Hack GU, or maybe it was like Tales of the Abyss or something. Anyways, I had an empty spot in my life, and I was looking for something new to fill it. And that is when, after a fair amount of browsing through the store shelves, I came across a blue little box purporting to hold a game called Persona 3 FES. I remember when I first saw it, and I flipped through the little handbook it came with, my first impressions weren't great. Or something about the art style that kind of put me off a little bit or something. It just looked weird compared to the anime look I was used to. But whatever the case, the game did have one thing going for it, and that was a blurb across the back stating, 70 plus hours of gameplay. And well, that was exactly what I was looking for, so I quickly bought the game and took it home and tried it. And so Persona 3 became my first experience with the series. I had never heard of it before. Back in the day, I really didn't use the internet for much of anything aside from playing Flash games on AddictingGames.com, so I had no idea what or wasn't popular. All my friends were playing like Star Wars Battlefront or Halo and the like. I was the only one who was into games like this, so I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And uh, well, boy howdy did I learn quickly how much I love this game. So enough of the backstory. For now, let's just talk about Persona 3. So when you compare P3 to the series as a whole, I think it's the easiest one to identify its strengths and its weaknesses. There are a ton of things I love and a fair number of things that I hate about this game. So let's start with the good stuff first. First of all, I'll start with the moon cycles in this game, which is a weird one to start off with, I guess, but it's true. 
The game tells you very early on about how every full moon a monster shadow will appear and you have to defeat it, and honestly, just as like the simple framework of the game from that, it works really well. There's just this like sense of suspense every month as a ticking deadline draws closer and closer, and the inevitable boss fight looms on the horizon. And then there's that wave of relief that washes over you once you do beat the boss and you know that you have so much more time before you have to worry about that again. It manages to create this wonderful mix of both dread and accomplishment that I don't think any of the other games in the series managed to replicate. I mean, 4 and 5 try to do something similar with the TV worlds and palaces, where they appear and you have a strict deadline to finish the dungeon by, but in those games you can just beat the boss, like, weeks in advance before the deadline happens, you know, the second day. And yeah, frequently that is exactly what I do. Plus, I mean, you already know for the most part what's waiting for you at the end, some manifestation of either a bad guy or your friend. In P3, like, yeah, you know, it's going to be a shadow, but you don't know what it will look like, where it will be, will there be more than one this time, how powerful will it be? Yeah. It's suspenseful, it's exciting, it's just mwah. Ah, the first two thirds of Persona 3 are beautiful. Those like perfect buzzwords that you love to hear about everything. Another great thing that the game does is characters, specifically how it integrates them into the story. Again, comparing to P4 and 5, in those games, characters will have a dungeon in which they have to overcome some part of themselves and they grow and become better people. Except for Haru who got half of her dungeon stolen by that stupid cat. Urgh. Uh, anyways, so these dungeons are usually great. They are amazing starting points for these characters, and a big part of the reason why the 4 and 5 casts are so damn lovable. But the main problem is, that's kind of where their growth stops. I mean, they do get their social links, which are nice and usually very enjoyable, but in the grand scheme of things, the social links are inconsequential. The game has to proceed at all times, as if you haven't finished them, even if you have. Because... Well, they're entirely optional, so any growth a character may go through in said social link will not be reflected in the main story. See again Haru, who despite already potentially being in a lovely relationship with Joker, having turned down her bitch-ass fiancé, will still wind up sitting next to him in a later scene. You punk-ass son of a bitch. Why don't I get to punch him? Uh, anyways, the point I'm getting to here is they do not do that in Persona 3. Most, if not all, of the character growth is tied directly into the story. And I think the best part that illustrates this is the fact that each character's awakening to their second persona is part of the main storyline. Sometimes it's somewhat insignificant, like Fuka, but sometimes it's dramatic and climactic and awesome, like when Junpei blows away those streg assholes after Chidori dies. But all of them happen regardless of what you do or who you hang out with. You will always get those characters' complete growths over the course of the storyline. Persona 2 kinda did this a bit, but it was basically just Yukiko who did it. I mean, the rest of you get the Greeks at like the exact same time. Persona 3 is the only one that directly ties everyone's new Persona awakening as an actual plot point, and I'm so upset that they don't do that anymore. Now, with that all being said, the game of course has its flaws as well, and they are certainly not nothing. The gameplay of course springs to mind, the main focus of the game being one big, long, procedurally generated maze of samey environments fighting palette swap versions of the same enemies over and over again. I mean, I know I gave Persona 1 a lot of flack for how tedious its dungeons were, and I still think that's warranted, but at least they designed theirs. I never gave Tartarus the flack it so rightly deserves. It is a fucking marathon and not an exciting one. And of course, the choice to not let you control the party member's actions can't be ignored either. I'm not going to say that there's no merit to this approach. There's kind of a charm, I guess, to making it so that your allies are less extensions of yourself and more their own unique entities. But that doesn't change the fact that losing to some random shadow because Mitsuru can't get it through her thick skull, that ice break is the most useless skill in existence, and you lose 45 minutes worth of progress is one of the most frustrating experiences in recorded history. <sighs> Another weakness comes sort of directly off of one of the strengths that I mentioned. I do think that narratively, at least, the characters in 3 are some of the best in the series. That is to say, they go through some of the biggest and most developed arcs of the lot. They're only really competing with Persona 2 in that regard, I'd say. But when it comes to the group as a whole, Seize just feels less 
cohesive than any of the other games. The characters are just less connected to one another. They're kind of just all going on their own individual stories, occasionally overlapping, but definitely separate. In every other game, you're always playing as what feels like a group of friends, people who fully rely on and trust one another without fail. And in Persona 3, they feel more like workplace associates? And I get that at the beginning, that's kind of the point. You're all from different walks of life, but you're forced into the strange situation together. But even by the end of the game, there's never that same bond that the other games have. The protagonist is probably the worst defender of this. I mean, look at the protagonist of 4 and 5. Who are the first people you really get to hang out with them? Your friends, Yosuke and Chihei, and in Ryuji. The P3 protagonist? You don't get to hang out with Yukari for months. Not till you drink enough of that damn coffee to warm her stone heart, that is. And you don't hang out with Junpei at all. You're too busy hanging out with your true soulmates, Kenji and the Gourmet King. <laughs> I'm just kidding, the Gourmet King is obviously a treasure. I mean, they kind of fixed this in P3P, but only for the Femsi side. Honestly, she seems like a much better leader than Slicko ever did. Oh, by the way, if anyone ever cared, my original character for Persona 3 was called Slicko Marx, so when I did the Femsi, I called her Silky Marx, just to be sort of like the female version of him. Actually, I've never explained why I give my characters such odd names, have I? It's sort of an inside joke that me and my brother have. Basically, a ways back, we were toying around with what to name him, and we started talking about how his hair kind of looked like a greasy emo mop. So eventually the name Slicko got kind of thrown out there, and my brother, being a big fan of classical comedy, said like, oh, you mean like one of the Marx Brothers? You know, there's Groucho Harpo, and this guy could be Slicko. And we both thought it was kind of funny, so uh, the name kind of stuck, and he became the long-lost Marx Brother, Slicko Marx. And since then, for every other persona, it's sort of become a tradition to name our characters like that. Their first name being sort of a descriptor of what they're like in some way, and their last name being taken from some famous comedy group. So we had Slicko Marx and Silky Marx, and then we had Silent Howard, the distant descendant of the Three Stooges, and Klepto Harl, created genetically with the DNA from both Laurel and Hardy. I can't remember exactly what I named the Persona 1 protagonist, just that his nickname was Bland. Though I'm pretty sure his last name was Belushi, though I'm not sure why I chose that. Uh, whatever, my and Tatsuya obviously can't change, because they're actual characters. Uh, whatever, that was a bit of a tangent. Uh, to summarize, Persona 3 was my first foray into the series, and for the longest time, was my favorite. But now that I look back on it, I noticed more and more of its flaws, and it's kinda slipped down from that top spot but it'll always have a special place in my mind. Best boy, Junpei, obviously. Best girl, Mitsuru, always bet on Empress. And of course, bestest boy, Koromaru. Ooh, Shoko boy, ooh, Shoko boy. Right, so next up, obviously, I played Persona 4. I can't remember exactly when it came out, but I'm pretty sure Persona 4 was released around the same time I started playing Persona 3, and this time I wasn't looking for something new. Now I just wanted more of that sweet, juicy, persona -y goodness that 3 had given me. I wanted it injected right into my veins. I was hungry for more, and well, having finished 3, what do you know? A new one was right there, perfectly lined up for me to start playing. And well, I definitely like the game, but I can't say it brought up the same emotions Persona 3 did. I feel like P4 is the most divisive game in the series? Eh, maybe that's not the right word. I mean, obviously it's well loved. But P4 was the game that really started to take Persona away from its Shin Megami Tensei roots, and move more in line with a high school anime with some darker elements to it. I mean, I'm not like the best person to say this or anything, I don't follow the fandom that much, but I feel like I've seen a fair amount of people who see Persona 4 as like the downswing in the series, or conversely as the highest point in the series. For me, the, I definitely lean more towards the former, but like it's still a very good game, just probably the second weakest in the series. Let's talk about it. So let's say what Persona 4 does right, first of all. I think the biggest thing it does is completely flip that one point I had in Persona 3. That is to say, it probably has the best group dynamic of any of the games. That also includes the converse that it has the weakest characters, but I'll come to that later. For now, the point is, the group of Persona 4 feels like a group of friends. There are dynamics at work here where everyone feels like they are actually friends with one another. Like there are interactions with everyone, they all feel like they know each other, trust each other, are part of the same team. Like. 
You could throw any two of them, lock them in a room, and there would be some dynamic between them. Any of them. You know, completely opposite sides of the team. I don't know, like you throw Yukiko and Kanji, or Chie and Naoto or something into a room, and I feel like they'd still work. You'd get like an interesting conversation out of that. It'd be worth watching. Persona 3, on the other hand, you, you just don't get that as much. I mean, it works with some of the characters, but like, imagine Fuka and Akihiko, or like Junpei and Shinji or something. It'd be just like dead silence, because none of the parties involved would know what to talk about. I mean, that's just it. The investigation squad is awesome, plain and simple. Moving on from that, obviously the combat system was all around just improved. You can control your party members now, getting knocked down isn't the end of the game anymore, and they got rid of that pure strike slash split, which on paper sounds worse, but in this case I think simplicity is to the game's benefit. One of the problems with the early game's combat systems was the inclusion of so many useless attributes. Remember in like Persona 1 and 2 when you had things like Whip and Axe and Tech and Havoc and Rush and whatever else the developers thought constituted a different weapon type. And I mean, there certainly were benefits to that at times, but more and more I'm happy that they just streamlined everything. There was also an improvement from 4 to 5, like 5 definitely has the best combat system of any Persona game, but like, it's only a slight improvement over 4. 4 was the game that really solidified what made a good Persona combat system. And finally, uh... I mean, it's kind of odd to say that Nanako is a settling point, but she kinda is. I mean, there's no one else really like her in the entire series. She's this, like, super important character that you have to take care of over the course of the entire game, but, like, she's not a party member or anything. She's just a really important social link. I mean, it feels like an odd thing to bring up in conversation about the pros and cons of each game, but really, if she wasn't in the game, I feel like this would be a thousand times worse. There's no situation in which Nanako doesn't improve. But, 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 with all that being said, obviously the game has its flaws. I did say it was my second least favorite persona, and there are a couple of reasons for this. The story, and especially the humor, lead a little too far in the light and cheerful direction, at least for my taste. And there's a lot of really weird side characters that get way too much screen time, like King Moron or Hanako or the weird sex craze teacher. But ultimately, if I had to point out one single thing that turns me off this game, it's I'm just not that huge a fan of the main cast. They're all just so... cliché? I mean, they're well done clichés, don't get me wrong, but I find a lot of their stories very predictable. Again, not to say that they're bad or that I don't enjoy their interactions, but they just felt less... I don't know, less real than some of my favorite characters in the other games. You know, it really feels like I'm watching a TV show, like a good TV show, but there's just a sort of disconnect where I never get that like personal connection that 2, 3, and 5 all managed to pull off better, at least in my mind. But I know I'm probably in the minority in that aspect. I've gotten a couple comments from people talking about how much they love the Persona 4 cast. I know characters like Naoto and Kanji are super popular. But for me, they just never really clicked. Also, can I just say that Yosuke is the worst character in all of Personadom? I mean, the first time I played this game, I didn't really think much of him, but after my second and third playthrough, he's really a misogynistic asshole, isn't he? Signs the girls up for a swimsuit competition because, oh, what's the big deal? You're hot and you can show off your body. Then acts all offended when they pull the same crap on him. God. I've never turned more on a character than I have on Yosuke. He is trash. Well, whatever. In summary, Persona 4 was the game that kind of connected with me the least. But I still think it's a hell of a game and well worthy of the amount of praise it gets. When it comes to the best characters, I mean, obviously Nanako, but uh, we'll skip past that. For best boy, it's Kanji, and for best girl, I mean Margaret, again, always bet on Empress, but you technically can't date her, so... Would you hate me if I said I? You know, the moon girl, the spoiled rich brat? <laughs> Normally I would have said Chie, but in my most recent playthrough, I tried out the romantic route on I's social link, and it was, like, way cuter than it had any right to be. <laughs> any Persona fan that watches this is going to be very upset, aren't they? Whatever. Up next comes Persona 2. 
Now, if I'm being completely honest, while I started Persona 2 next, I didn't actually finish it until after Persona 5. Uh, let me explain. So, the year was 2011 or 2012, something like that. At that point, I'm a huge fan of the whole Persona series, and I've looked up reviews and visited communities online and all that jazz, so I have a general idea of what I'm getting myself into. That is to say, when I bought Innocent Sin for the PSP, I knew it was quite a bit different from 3 or 4. So, I put it in and played it, and I hated it. Okay, hate is a strong word, but I was very disappointed. The combat system was a drag, the encounter rate was way too high, and everything was so damn easy. It was this tedious grind is all it felt like to me at the time. I think I made it up to like the aerospace museum? No, I think I made it past that part to where you find Shadow Maya and for some reason nobody has a clue that that's not the real her. Uh, in any event, I dropped the game for several years after that, vowing never to look back. Until come late 2017. I had finished off 5 and was looking for something to do. And at that point, I had seen talk here or there about Persona 2. You know, that usual stuff that you see whenever Persona 2 gets brought up, how underrated it is, how the new games ruined it, how they want Atlas to bring it back, blah 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 blah, stuff like that. And well, I figured it was going to be a long time before Atlas made any new Persona content, so I figured I might as well give the game a second chance and see where the series originated from. And oh my god, was I ever wrong, because these games are amazing! The day after I finished Innocent Sin, I immediately went onto the PlayStation Network, downloaded a digital copy of Eternal Punishment, and played through that as well. Then, a year later, I played through the games again, and made my first ever YouTube video. So, Persona 2, oh, by the way, I'm obviously going to be talking about both games as if they were one. Uh, anyways, Persona 2 shares a lot of the same strengths, I feel, as Persona 3, but in a different enough way. I think Persona 3 explores the growth of its characters in a more interesting way, and I think it has a better mystery. The whole, you know, what are the Twelve Shadows and why are they appearing on the full moon is much more interesting than that rather odd why are rumors coming true, at least to me. But Persona 2 has, like, this heart to it that I've never seen in any other game. I said of the Persona 4 characters that I don't really connect with any of them that much. Well, with Persona 2, the exact opposite problem happens. I connect with all of them so damn much. I just love them all so much. Why can't you give Tatsuya a happy ending game? Why? As for the overall story, again, I think P3 is stronger overall, but 2 just has these, like, moments of brilliance. They're scattered between lesser moments, but still, they're just brilliant, some of these things. You got things like the cast confronting their shadows, Maya telling Tatsuya about Mr. Bun Bun, that freaking amazing scene in Eternal Punishment where Baofu tells Tatsuya that grown up life is just a more shit version of teenage life, and of course the coup de grace, the death of Maya. Oh my god, that was pain, that was real pain, I mean, Maya getting his spear jabbed in her side was, uh, that was us, that was that was the game going to us, like, and we're going, no, how could you? There's nothing in the series I can even compare. Okay, maybe the death of Nanako, but even then, like, Nanako gets magic back to life with no real negative consequences, but bringing Maya back causes the destruction of an entire plane of existence. Ugh. This, this game, like, it, it brings out emotions in me that nothing else has managed to. I mean, I could go on and on, like I could talk about how much I miss the different Velvet Room themes, like Aria the Soul is good and all, but Variety is a spice of life, man. Bring back Belladonna and Nameless, goddammit. Uh, but whatever. This video is getting pretty lengthy, and we still have two more games to go, so let's just talk about the flaws for now. Of course, the big one is the gameplay is the worst the series has ever seen. I mean, Persona 1's combat has some serious flaws, but it's unique and interesting and there's at least some strategy to it. Persona 2, especially Innocent Sin, just combat is a chore. Basic enemies offer barely any resistance, little more than a speed bump in your way. The card collection part to summon new personas is neat in a sense, it's cool to watch all the wacky stuff your characters do to converse with demons and whatnot, but to optimize how you do it you have to fight the same enemy since you can only make three contacts at a time, which means you have to keep doing the same actions over and over again, and it just develops into this pure, unfiltered 
grind and I hate it. The dungeons themselves are also pretty bad. I mean, not quite as confusingly laid out as ones or drawn out as Tartarus, but they're still pretty bad. As for complaints that don't involve gameplay, well, it's basically just that the game lacks that whole daily routine life aspect that the other games have. I mean, you know, it's not really the game's fault or anything, it's just the developers hadn't thought up the idea yet. But it just means the characters aren't quite as fleshed out, I guess. I mean, obviously they're strong, since all their characterization gets worked into the main plot, but you just don't get to see, you know, what they do in their time off. You don't get those, like, extra little bits of world building that the later games have access to. So the characters are a little more flat? Would that be the correct term? Just not quite as developed in smaller aspects than in the other games, though still obviously very strong in their own right. Still, I adore this game, and much like many fans, I continue to hope, vainly, that one day Papa Atlas will give this game some recognition once again. Overall, a great game. Best girl, Maya, obviously. Always bet on, uh, moon. Best boy, uh... Oh fuck, how am I supposed to choose? Um, uh, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, uh, Ekachi. Sure, uh, honestly, you could argue any one of the boys is best boy, and I'd agree with you. Maya's like a step above the other girls, but Lee Soon and Lala are awesome as well. And, and you know, I don't really think you can count Yukino, know, Nandro, or Ellie, can you? Uh, I don't know, moving on. Persona 5 is the big one. Not much to say on the background here, I think I was like pretty much everyone else with this one. I saw the big announcement, got hyped as hell, waited a year for the damn thing to come out, then waited another year for it to be playable in a language I understood. So Persona 5 is very much a sequel to 4, not in like the direct sense, but just that they took a lot of the concepts Persona 4 was working on and built on them. And well, as someone who said 4 was their second least favorite, you would think that would bode poorly for the game. But if I'm being honest, Persona 5 is my favorite. They took a lot of the complaints I had with 4 and improved on them in my mind. I think it's safe to say that Persona 5 is the most popular game in the franchise. I mean, Atlas seems desperate to whore out Joker to any company that's willing to throw them a few bucks. He's got a costume in Sonic Forces for fuck's sakes! So it's not surprising that the game's gotten around. But I do have to say within the Persona fandom, while I think it's generally agreed that it's a great game, I feel like it has the most vocal detractors? I don't know, maybe that's just because I hang around smaller communities where saying Persona 2 is underrated is the number one most repeated phrase, but for whatever reason I seem to see a fair amount of hate for this game. When it comes to me personally, I actually kind of find it odd that I consider this to be the superior persona. I've always found myself to be something of a contrarian. You know, those smug sons of bitches who ruin conversations amongst fans. What's the best Final Fantasy? Final Fantasy Tactics, of course. What's the best Pokemon? XD Gale of Darkness. <sighs> those kinds of people are the ones my minds usually align with. Unfortunately, I really shudder to think what that says about me, but for some reason this time I find myself aligning with the popular kids. Alright, well, let's talk about what Persona 5 does right, first of all. When it comes to the big three things I really look for, namely story, characters, and gameplay, I would say Persona 5 does it all... good. Like, above average. In very general terms, it just has no real weaknesses in those regards, though I would say each game before it does at least one of those aspects better than it. But what 5 has going for it is so many other little things that make playing 5 unlike any game I've ever played before. To say that Persona 5 has style would be an understatement, but I'll say it anyway. Persona 5 has STYLE! Like, Damn, every little aspect of this game is a joy to behold. The characters holding up their HP and MP bars like they're holding up their present numbers, the combat's quick movement and flashy attacks, the thousands of ways in which the menu plays around with the whole Phantom Thieves thing. Did you know that if you go to the load screen in Royal, it'll show Joker swinging around on his grappling hook, and occasionally he'll screw up and swing and come crashing down onto the back of the screen before sliding down Looney Tunes style? It's amazing. The amount of finesse within this game is off the charts. Adding on top of that are the dungeons, which do an excellent job at making you feel like a phantom thief. Crawling through ducks, swinging from rafter to rafter, sneaking up on guards, etc, etc, etc. I mean, they're not all amazing or anything, but compared to the mind-breaking labyrinths and procedurally generated tedium of Persona's past, they're a godsend. And of course, who could forget the music? I mean, 
Don't get me wrong, music in Persona has never been an issue, but Persona 5 elevated to a level I did not think was possible. Each and every song fits the situation so perfectly. My personal favorite has to be the one from the first half of Makoto's Dungeon. I think it's called Price or something. Look it up, the song is a banger. There's just so many little things like that that come together and make the game more than the sum of its parts. The thousands of side activities you can do, the fact that social links have benefits outside of leveling up your personas, the fact that your friends text you on a near daily basis, which doesn't sound like much, but really helps to make the cast feel like a genuine group of friends helping each other out. Most of all, I could just play this game again and again, and I get a decent amount of enjoyment whenever I do. Whereas whenever I try to replay 2 or 3, I find myself getting frustrated at some of their more archaic design choices. But of course, with that all being said, it too has its flaws, some rather big ones actually. Which is why whenever I see someone say the game is overrated, I can at least see where they're coming from. The biggest that comes to my mind is the plot. Now, beforehand, I called this game's plot above average, but it's not exactly that simple. It's more like everything up until the end of Sai's dungeon is amazing, and everything after that is... meh. Which I would say averages out as above average. Shido is the least compelling villain of any persona, and that includes crotchety old NWO leader, I would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for you meddling kids and your damn dog. Shido's like kind of foreshadowed, but all it really shows is like, oh look, he's an asshole. Then we get to the end of the game and it goes, oh, he really was an asshole. Hooray. Akechi's whole plot and reveal of being the surprise villain and ultimate last minute conversion to the good guys was terribly done. One of the few things Persona 4 did a million times better with Adachi. And Yell the Beoth was... I mean, it was kind of cool how it turned out we've been working with an evil Igor this entire time, and that, and that super evil new voice of his wasn't just an aesthetic choice, but, but yeah, he's as compelling as cardboard. Not that Nyx or Izanami were much better. Whatever. Also, there's in this entire little drama in the middle of the game where Mona gets this random inferiority complex, and it so does not land. Like, literally everyone on the team keeps telling him he's a valued member of the team and pointing out a bunch of ways he's been super helpful to them. But he doesn't listen and goes like, Oh guys, you don't appreciate me. And Ryuji gets passive aggressive like one time and bam, the stupid cat steals half of Haru's dungeon from her. All this focus that should have been going to best girls instead going to your stupid cartoon face, you damn cat. How dare you do this to best girl? Give it back. Give her back our straight dad. You useless feline! <sighs> it's weird and a little sad to have a 2D crush like this, but there's a part of me that wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, anyways, l let's summarize. Persona 5 is, in my mind, the best all-round game in the series. The one that does almost everything right, though it never does quite hit the high notes that previous games did. Best boy, tough choice, but it's gotta be Ryuji. Best girl? I mean, you know what I'm going to say on this, right? I always bet on Empress. By the way, you can argue with me on all the all the bests I've been giving, by the way, but this is the one hill I will die on. Aru's social link is mwah. It's perfect. It's like a plate of the finest pasta you ever had. And anyone who says otherwise, I will physically walk into your house and punch you in the schnoz. Getting a little hyper there. Okay, let's just go to the end and talk about the final Persona game. The one I only played because I had to make a video about it. And personally, I think it's impossible to debate that this is indeed the weakest persona. The characters don't go through much development, the majority of them being entirely optional. The plot is fairly basic with some very obvious twists. Look, the girls who look exactly like Maki turn out to be Maki! Who could have guessed? And the dungeons, as I've mentioned before, suck. It's just up to you to decide whether or not they're worse than Tartarus. But all those things aren't the game's fault, except for the dungeon design. I mean, it's just, it was the first game. They didn't know what direction they were going in. They were still drawing most of their inspiration for Shin Megami Tensai. Of course things are going to be rough. The characters themselves are all pretty cool. They're a unique and diverse bunch. They just suffer from the fact that the game doesn't contain much in the way of dialogue, so they can't grow all that much. 
It's all just very brief and to the point. I remember when I made my Persona 1 video, there was a scene where Mark slaps Nanjo for suggesting that they leave Maki inside her own head, and I made it out like Mark gives this big speech about friendship and not leaving someone who clearly needs help without it, but really, that scene was like three lines long each? Mark basically goes, you're a dick, how could you turn your back on a friend? And Nanjo goes like, oh yeah, my bad, I was being kind of a dick. Poor writing is, I guess, the biggest problem with this game, or more just there's not a lot of it. But while I do think my complaints were valid, I do feel like I was probably harsher on Persona 1 than I was on the others, like, unduly so in some cases. The game does have its strong points. The combat is one of them, surprisingly. The whole positioning system added a unique element of strategy that made boss fights challenging but in a more rewarding way than most other Personas manage. My only real complaint with it was that it was just really poorly balanced. Certain weapons were useless while others were god tier. For example, shotguns and derringers had crap damage and even crappier range while sniper rifles could hit any unit on the map multiple times. Uh, the game also had two different storylines and multiple different recruitable characters, which added a lot to the game's replayability. Which means it's one of the few Persona games which just has some replayability inherently built into it. Also. <laughs> This is kind of small, but I say living that thug life, yo, is some of the funniest shit I have ever seen. She is ruthless, and I love it. But yeah, at the end of the day, it is the weakest of the bunch. But, I mean, being weaker than the freaking behemoth Ciceri has managed to churn out isn't really a bad thing. It's kind of expected, honestly. So, I'll say again what I've said before. If you're a fan of Persona and have been putting off playing the first installment because people say it's weaker than its descendants, you really should give it a try. It does have a charm all its own. Best girl, Yukino. Always bet on Empress. Best boy, um, uh, uh, Reiji. I know I didn't use him in my playthrough, but uh, he's pretty cool. And, uh, that's it, I guess. Um, if you're one of the few people who managed to stay awake to this rambling spew of nothing important, uh, thanks for listening, I guess. I hope you'll check out my next Toad Long. It's got nothing to do with Persona or the greater SMT-verse, so I imagine it won't get quite as much traction as my other videos have, but I'm looking forward to its release. I'm actually pretty happy with how it's turning out so far. I guess all that's left for me is to chop out all the dead air in this audio and post it. Oh, <gasps> what music am I going to put to this? I mean, obviously, just some Persona music would make sense, but I always like trying to put more obscure stuff in my videos. By the way, if you ever want to cheer me up for whatever reason, just leave a comment saying something about how well a song fit into a part of one of my videos or something, and I swear, it'll leave me grinning like a big dumb goof that I am. Uh, sorry, I'm going completely off the rails here. Uh, I'm done now, so thanks very much for listening. I hope to see you again. Bye.